Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Claudio Borio. Claudio is the director of the Monetary and Economic Department at the Bank for International Settlements, also known as the BIS, and has been there in various roles since 1987. Previously, he was an economist with the OECD. Claudio is the author of numerous publications in the field of monetary policy, banking, finance, and issues related to financial stability. He is a leading voice on macro prudential regulation as well as on international monetary stability issues. Today, he joins us to talk about these and other issues. Claudio, welcome to the show. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, I'm glad to have you on. I've, I've read your work through the years. As a graduate student, I read your work, so I've been following you for many years, so it's a real treat to have you on. I want to begin this show by asking the same question I have to all my previous guests, and that is, how did you get into macroeconomics? Mm. Well, um, I was uh, an undergraduate in Oxford. I, I was doing uh, politics, philosophy, and economics. So economics was one of the one of the subjects. Uh, it was the subject in which I specialized, even as an undergraduate. So okay. I did two additional papers, and one of those papers, by the way, was money. Um, this was in the late seventies, uh, and I think that. The type of approach uh, or initiation that I had to economics would be unthinkable these days. Then, as a graduate, I was uh, I was there doing a, a DPhil and a, um, uh, or the equivalent of a PhD, and my thesis was on monetary policy and the financial system in Italy. So, hence the approach to macroeconomics. My approach to macroeconomics is uh, somewhat eclectic because uh, I cannot really see how one can properly understand macroeconomics without having a good understanding of money and credit. And on top of that, by good, I really mean also having a reasonable, historically rooted perspective, so beyond what uh, the profession has done over the last 15 to, to 20 years. Um, and so that's, that's basically how I came to the, came to the subject. Yeah, if you read your papers, um, you see that, that, that emphasis, you know, the credit perspective, money, and then history. You always are sure to bring in a lot of rich history into it. Um, so you've been working at the BIS for a number of years. Maybe you can explain to our listeners what the BIS is, what it does, and, and then also what is it like, typical day of work there? Um, well, the, the BIS is uh, an institution that is owned by central banks uh, in the world, the uh, 60 shareholders, and it, uh, therefore it serves central banks. Um, we do a number of things. We host some key central bank committees, uh, like, for example, the Basel Committee uh, or the Committee on, uh, on the Global Financial System, the Committee on uh, Payments and Market Infrastructure. These are committees that look at various aspects of the global uh, financial system and work on them. And as you know, the Basel Committee is the committee that sets banking regulation for much of, uh, much of the world. So that's one side of uh, what we do. Another thing that we do is to prepare um, the, for uh, meetings of senior policymakers, deputy governors to, uh, to governor level. Um, uh, they meet regularly here and we prepare uh, the background documents for, for those meetings. We also produce statistics and we also produce research and uh, our own publications. Um, I think that our main mission, as the mission statement says in the on the website, is that to try and uh, further and help uh, monetary and financial uh, co uh, stability, well, cooperation of monetary and financial stability uh, among central banks around the world. On top of that, we're also a bank, uh, and we manage... Um, uh, a significant proportion of world reserves. So, so working at the BIS day to day, you you come in, you do research, you have meetings, um, you interact with central bankers. That's correct. Yes, I mean that's very much what uh, a typical economist would do here. And then the balance of the work, of course, would depend on 
where you are in the department, where you're more on the secretariat side. If you're there, of course, uh, you do less research. And uh, if, on the other hand, you're more on, on some of the other uh, units, uh, then you can afford to do more research. But uh, in a way, research and uh, serious uh, analytical work is an input into all the things that uh, that we do here. Okay. Now, I, I think the BIS, uh, at least in my mind, my impression was got well-known um, publicly leading up to the Great Recession because the BIS was putting out these warnings. You know, mm-hmm. Look out, there's a big credit boom going on. Look out, something's going to happen. Um, you gave out warnings, you know, fe- the Federal Reserve needs to be careful, mindful, keeping rates, what seems like really low rates relative to credit growth. So can you tell us a little bit about that that history and, and maybe, you know, segueing into kind of the first part of our conversation on macroeconomics, what did you see happening leading up to the Great Recession? What were the warning signs mm-hmm. and what were the uh, messages you were trying to tell central bankers? Well, I, I, as you know, the lead up uh, to the Great Recession was called the Great Moderation. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think the, the basic belief uh, behind that was that price stability was sufficient for macroeconomic stability. Uh, the view that the financial system, that financial markets were self-equilibrating, which meant that you could exclude them from your uh, analytical frameworks, from your models, from the way that you look at, uh, looked at the world. And here, of course, at the BIS, we were convinced that this was not the, the right approach. Um, as maybe that's partly because uh, of... Uh, the intellectual history of the institution, um, but also because all you had to do was to look at history to see that this was not the case. And you could look at recent history and see what had happened in Japan or uh, in the Asian crisis. Uh, but you could go even further back in history and look at what had happened during the run-up to the Great Depression or even episodes of financial instability uh, crisis during the gold standard. Now, these were all episodes in which, um, or periods in which you had price stability, low inflation, stable inflation, and yet at the same time, you had the buildup of financial problems in, in the form, in the typical form of very strong credit booms and asset price increases, what we tended to call financial, financial imbalances. Um, the very experience of Japan, uh, an advanced economy, was uh, regarded at the time, given the hubris at the time, as simply simply an aberration. So it was basically just looking at the world through a different lens that uh, made us worry. And from around 2000 onwards, we did we started doing quite a bit of work in in this area. We had already done a little bit before, but I would say that the most important pieces of work uh, were done from 2000 onwards, looking into the relationship between monetary and financial stability, looking at the nature of financial booms and busts, and uh, with the notion of pro-cyclicality being very prominent. Um, and, um, And this basically led to two strands of work. The work on what should monetary policy do about it? How should one change monetary policy frameworks? And what should uh, regulation and supervision or prudential policy do about it. And uh, the former, as you know, is paying more attention to financial stability when trying to prevent the buildup of these problems in, in the case of monetary policy. And in the case of uh, prudential policy, it was the whole idea of setting up uh, macro prudential frameworks, frameworks that had a more systemic orientation. Okay. Well, your work during that time, you know, 2003, 2004, really resonated with me because um, I had studied under George Selgin, and he had really stressed, you know, looking at productivity right. and its effect on the price level. And during that period, from 2002 to 2004, was kind of like the last part of the productivity boom. And it was, it was rap- productivity growth was rapid. It was in the press. I mean, people were aware. They were talking of it. And, and you know, all else equal, that productivity boom would have implied, you know, disinflation, and a higher kind of, you know, natural interest rate. Um, yeah. But the Fed reacted in the opposite direction, right? They, they got worried about the low inflation and they pushed rates low. And, and so what you guys were arguing was like, hey, you're taking the wrong approach here and you're, you're helping fuel these financial imbalances. So interestingly, it really, it really resonated. And, um, and I, you know, I, 
the you know the uh, predictions, the warnings you were making, you know, came to fruition. Unfortunately, and we had unfortunately, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the great the great recession and, and the slow recovery. Um, before I move on, one one other argument that you made that, that I've also made, I, I I share the view anyhow, and that deals with the global imbalances prior to to the oh, great recession. Yeah, 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 you and yeah. a a co-author PTDs at that. Yes, thank you for saying his name. Um, <laughs> 2011 paper, I believe, or 2012 paper, you ha- you argue, you know, kind of the standard story is global imbalance is a result of this excess savings finding its way to America. Um, yeah, but you yeah, guys yeah, make yeah. A, a kind of a different argument. Could you share that with us? Well, uh, yes, I, th- th- to to uh, try and make the story the story relatively simple. I mean, uh, what we the the macroeconomic profession. Uh, because it was not paying attention to financial aspects, was looking at current account imbalances. And they saw that as being the root of all evil. Uh, We, by contrast, were approaching uh, the the problem from the financial side. And so we were concerned about financial imbalances. Uh, To put it simply, this financial booms, the the strong credit growth, Mm -hmm. the strong increase in property prices, uh, very... Uh, uh, signals of very aggressive risk taking in in the market. Um, so, uh, to the extent that the current account played a role, whether the current account of the United States or the global configuration of current accounts, um, it was a sideshow. In the case of the United States, uh, more specifically, we thought it was simply a reaction of what was going on at home, the financial balances that were built up at, uh, built up at home. Um, so we didn't see, uh, if you like, the flip side of that, the, uh, the current account surplus of, as the, of the rest of the world, uh, world as a cause of the lower rates that were uh, than one had in the United States. We saw that very much as a monetary and, and financial phenomenon. Um, so to cut a long story short, there, there are many aspects to it, but um, we felt that it was very, it's very important uh, not to focus on current account. If we are interested in financial stability issues, not mm-hmm. to focus on current account imbalances, which are net capital flows, but at least to focus on gross capital flows, which are much, much, much bigger than net capital flows. By the way, you, it would probably, it didn't, I'm sure that it didn't escape your notice that the, the banks that were most exposed um, to the United States and made the largest losses uh, were the banks in the, uh, in the United Kingdom that had a current account deficit and in the euro area that had a current account surplus. Or just to give you a sense of the relative magnitude of what we're talking about, um, net capital flows inflows into the United States fell only marginally during 2008. So the current account position it changed by 20 billion, but growth inflows decreased by no less than 1.6 trillion, uh, which is a 75 percent decline. So we're talking 20 billion versus 1.6 trillion. I mean, it's no comparison. So you missed you missed the whole picture if you focused on on just the current account. The net flows, you missed the huge change in, in gross flows. And, and that's the thing that's been running through a lot of your research. Let me throw something out there just to get your take on this. So one of the thoughts I had about the global imbalance discussion leading up to yeah. the Great Recession is that it was in part fueled by Federal Reserve policy in the following way. Not entirely, but in part. And mm-hmm. it went something like this. Given that a large number of countries pegged their currency to the dollar, so I'm thinking of China and some of the yep. um, emerging <laughs> markets, whenever the, the Fed began to ease in the early to mid 2000s, those countries had to, you know, basically adopt the same policy. When you when you peg, as you know, you you take yep. on the monetary policy of the country to which you peg. Yeah, yep, and yep. so you know, so what they had, to, I mean, this maybe the concrete steps is the Fed, you know, it it it, it eases. So China has to go out there and buy up dollars. It does that by you know, creating more of its own currency. Um, now, it, now it has bought up all these dollars. What does it do with the dollars? It goes and buys treasury securities, mm-hmm. goes and buys mortgage-backed securities. So in a sense, the Fed's easing was being recycled back into the United States via you know, the savings glut. So some part of the savings glut was an endogenous response right, to the right. Fed's easing. Is that a reasonable story? Um, 
Uh, it is a very reasonable story. I, I would not, though, use the term of the quote-unquote saving lot because the okay. as as we uh, but we don't need to go into this detail. But as we say very clearly in uh, in the 2011 paper with Pity and uh, in a paper that uh, we produced in 2015 that takes the argument further with also the help of a simple or a Mickey Mouse model for to fix ideas. I mean, there is no real relationship between saving and, and financing. Okay. And okay. current accounts are about saving and investment balances and uh, financing is a cash flow concept, which is why it's much more related to the gross capital flows and so on. But leaving that aside, leaving that aside, sure. um, I think you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are basically two ways in which the United States has a, uh, an outsized impact on, on the rest of the world. The first is what I would call an indirect way, uh, and you described, uh, described an example of that, which is the fact that U.S. Uh, monetary policy easing uh, will tend to, because of the big role that the United States plays in the global financial markets, will tend to re be resisted to the extent that it is resisted by other economists because they don't like to see the appreciation for a, whatever reason, um, mm -hmm. will then engender easier monetary policy in the rest of the world. Uh, and as you know, McKinnon had already written about this many, many years ago in, in the context even of flexible exchange rates and the like. Um, so that's one channel, and it's the channel that you mentioned, uh, and it's indeed a very important channel, probably the most important channel. Then you have an even more direct channel, which is not through the reaction function or the response of other authorities, but occurs directly uh, from the fact that the dollar is a major international currency. It is not just 90% of all transactions or 60% of reserves or indeed 60% of private sector international assets and liabilities held outside the United States. Uh, by the way, just to give an example, there is something like 9.8 trillion uh, dollar lending to non-US, uh, non-bank borrowers or residents outside the United States. 3.3 .3 of that is in emerging market economies. And two thirds, two thirds of that 9.8 trillion, roughly, it is financed outside the United States as well. So these dollars never touch US shores. That gives you a sense That's of how amazing. huge the, the role of the United States yeah. is. Um, then, as you know, the dollar is also used as a unit of account in uh, half of global trade. And if you try and see, and this goes back to the reaction functions that we were talking about to some extent, if you see how currencies move, if you compare the three international currencies, the dollar, and then way, way back, uh, 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 the, the euro, and even a much longer way back, the, um, uh, the yen, the dollar, again, the gravitational pull of the dollar in terms of uh, currencies outside the United States is something like 60%. 60 so 60% 60 of the world is part of what you might call the U.S. dollar zone. So the fact that you have so much, um, uh, so many assets and liabilities, uh, in particular liabilities, in dollars outside the United States means that changes in U.S. monetary policy have a direct impact on financial conditions outside the United States. And this is something which is very important in particular for emerging market economies, which is why a, a tightening of, uh, uh, of U.S. policy has an outsized impact on, on uh, countries outside the United States and in particular in emerging market economies. Yeah, let's, I, I want to actually, let, I'll come back to the Great Recession. I want to jump ahead and talk about that right now since we're on it. So you mentioned, you know, one thing is that the, there's this big, you call dollar zone, I think called the dollar block. All these mm -hmm. countries that you know, basically have to follow the Fed if they maintain their peg and, and all the transactions. But, but I, it's incredible, and you guys keep track of this, and I would recommend my listeners to go to the BIS's website, look at their statistics, and they have all this data on credit and also what, what uh, currency the credit's issued in. But um, basically what you've said is almost $10 trillion in dollar-denominated debt that's issued and, and, and used outside the U.S., never touches the shores. And so I... I think that's a very powerful image. You know, it, it's, it's, it's tremendously large. And I think we see the, um, the effect of that this year, right? So the Federal Reserve, December 2015, they raised interest rates for the first time since they, they hit the zero lower bound. And then soon afterwards, we see, you know, 
in fact, I, actually leading up to it, just the expectation of it, and, and late, you know, late mm-hmm. 2015, and then early 2016, we, we see all all, the, all these problems, problems in China, talks about recessions early in the year, and then you see the FOMC members of the board, they become a little more cognizant, a little more aware that their actions affect you know, the global channel. They they become more explicit. There's there's global there's global repercussions to them getting you know, raising rates. Uh, too, too fast. It may be domestic conditions warrant it, but there's this global fallout. Um, so it makes life for the Fed very, very difficult. Um, they have a domestic mandate, but they have a global reach. Absolutely. I mean, that uh, that is clearly uh, a big uh, one of the concerns that uh, people have about the global, uh, the inter- what people call the international monitoring, uh, international monitoring financial system. Uh, effectively, there are two concerns there. The first one is the one you mentioned, the asymmetries that the interest of the dominant country need not coincide with the interest of the rest of the world. And the second, which is related but not quite the same, is that the system as a whole does not have a sufficiently strong monetary and, and uh, monetary anchor, a monetary and financial anchor. Um, uh, if you ask me, and, uh, and I gave a speech on this um, mid-year, I think, um, the first is clearly a problem, but it is not obvious to me that a more pluralistic system would necessarily result in a more stable uh, global uh, monetary system, because you could also have competition in uh, uh, a race to the bottom, if you like, competition in laxity. Mm-hmm. And we have seen some signs of that in, 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 in recent years. So the, the, to me, the, the priority, and that's why we're focusing so much on it, is to put strong anchors in place in, in, in domestic jurisdictions. And then, after you've done that, to deal with the more global global issues. And part of that, in our view, is to precisely uh, adjust uh, monetary regimes and adjust uh, prudential regimes and possibly even use fiscal policy to... Uh, mm-hmm. more consciously to deal with these financial booms and busts that occur okay. um, in the key well, jurisdictions. This, this, you know, the use of the dollar is, is the main reserve currency of the world and all the problems it presents that we've been talking about. You know, it reminds me of the Triffin Dilemma. Yeah. Um, you know, what's, what's ideal for the U.S. is not what's ideal for the world. The world, and, and, and it kind of maybe begs at a deeper question, and that is, you know, is there a natural tendency for the world to want to have a common a, a a unit of account, some currency that everything can be denominated. In other words, <laughs> if, if if you started everything over, if you can started you know Earth's history over, would there kind of naturally emerge a currency like the dollar? I mean, it was the pound before; it's the dollar now. Is there just a natural tendency for the market to work itself to a point where they you know the world wants some ultimate safe medium of account? Right. Um, and and we're just going to have to wrestle that the Triffin dilemma is going to be with us no matter what we do. Or is there a solution to this? Um, well, let's say that clearly the world, um, for, for a number of reasons that uh, I don't need to go into it, uh, there are huge economies of scale in terms of information and so on if you have mm-hmm. uh, a single currency. Uh, how many currencies you have at the end of the day is, is, is less of an economic issue and more of a political issue. Uh, but so even if you are going to have um, many, as we have nowadays, many countries in the world and, and so on, and as I'm sure we will continue to have for many years to come, um, th- there is going to be a tendency for international transactions and so on to gravitate towards a few international uh, international currencies. And I, I think this is this is inevitable. Whether it's going to be one hugely dominant or not, I'm, it's less obvious to me. But clearly, uh, it's going to be few. There is only room yeah, for I, a few. I remember Barry Eichengreen had a book out, um, maybe two, right before the crisis emerged, um, called The Exorbitant Privilege. And uh, in the book, you know, he was making the prediction, well, the dollar is it for now, the dollar is a reserve currency for now, but give a few years, maybe a few decades, you know, the euro and the, the Chinese yuan, will, the Chinese currency will be there as well. Of course, then mm-hmm. soon after that, we had the crisis mm-hmm. in, the, in the euro. People begin to question the euro and, and then concerns about China. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, 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 as you know, it's a mixture of uh, economic size, 
above all also financial size, uh, the, mm-hmm. the depth and breadth of your market. Uh, and then there are a number of issues about uh, contract law, the infrastructure that you have, the uh, the trust that you have in yeah. a particular jurisdiction and continuing to be there as a jurisdiction, uh, contracts being upheld and so on and so forth. And then, of course, you have the broader geopolitical considerations that uh, come into it. And it's a mixture of all of these. And unless you have all of these credentials, then you cannot aspire to to be a major international currency. And then how many of those uh, there will be, then that will depend on the relative merits of each. All right, you, you've touched on this already, but let me ask this question. What would you recommend be done to the international monetary system to make it more resilient, more robust, so that we don't get these financial imbalances? Given that we do have a reserve currency, the, the dollar, and we have a central mm-hmm. bank with a domestic mandate for the U.S. economy, what can be done to the international monetary system to make it more robust? Um, well, let me... Let me mention then four steps uh, of, okay. I would say, increasing degree of um, ambition. I mean, the first one, first and most important one, which, again, I think is going to be very even quite difficult to put in place, is to have adequate, strong monetary and financial anchors in, in national jurisdictions. Now, okay. the question is, what does that mean? And what that means depends on, on, uh, on it's like it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, for us uh, at the BIS, this means putting in place, place what we call macrofinancial stability frameworks, which are frameworks that deal uh, that I must succeed in taming these financial booms and busts more successfully than the ones we have now. And that requires some changes in monetary policy, in prudential policy, regulation and supervision, financial regulation and supervision, and in fiscal policy. I think the, we have made the, the most advances on the prudential and regulatory side with this macroprudential frameworks in particular, we're still quite some way both on the monetary, let alone on on the fiscal side. And in the annual report over the last two to three years, we have tried to, if you like, uh, look at the various aspects of what that framework might might look like. In the latest one, we looked in particular at, at fiscal policy, but also at monetary policy. So first of all, you put strong anchors at the domestic level. If you do that, then the the likelihood and intensity of uh, what people call spillovers, negative spillovers to other jurisdictions should decline by okay. quite some uh, some bit uh, to a considerable extent. So, so then you can think of how to deal with the interaction of national regimes. And there you have three possible steps. One is we might call enlightened self-interest, which is a particularly important responsibility for the large jurisdictions. That is, Still using is still in full respect of the national mandates because this is something that cannot be avoided. Um, try and take into account uh, how other countries react to their policies and what the impact of that on their own country is going to be. Um, okay. um, if in, in, in economic uh, terms, one could say not not uh, try not to behave. Um, uh, like in an in a Nash equilibrium, but to to be to behave as a Stackelberg leader. Um, okay. The second the second step would be occasional coordination in prevention, not just in crisis management. I think uh, particular central banks are extremely good when it comes to monetary policy, in particular, to um, uh, to cooperate uh, in crisis management. Less so in prevention, for for the reasons that we partly mentioned earlier. The, the adequacy or inadequacy of domestic uh, policy regimes and the focus on inflation, exclusive focus on inflation. And then, of course, you could go even one step further, which is to agree on some rules of the game uh, that would help to instill more discipline at the national level. But the problem is that unless you agree on what the nature of the uh, of the illness or the problem you're trying to tackle is, uh, you will not be able to reach a consensus on the next steps. And there has been agreement on, on the prudential side. There is no such agreement in particular on the monetary policy side. Okay. So do, do you have these steps 
outlined in a paper, or is there like a, a manual for improving? Uh, the they are discussed. Uh, they are discussed, but not spelled out in a tremendous amount of detail in okay. uh, in a number of places, including uh, including the speech that I mentioned earlier. Some speeches that were given by our general manager in uh, Jaime Caruana in in the annual report as well. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, to be more precise, we had a chapter, not this year, the previous year, in the annual report on uh, the international monetary and financial system, and it goes into some detail on all of these okay. questions. Great. All right. I want to kind of move back now to the, to the Great Recession talk. Um, we were discussing what led up to it, and we went into it, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been seven, eight years since, you know, the bottom of it. It's It's now well over um and, and you had an article in the Cato Journal a talk that you gave at the conference there the conference was late uh 2015 that came out in the journal this year and it was interesting cuz the title of the article was revisiting the three intellectual pillars of monetary policy and uh, i want to just read a few excerpts from it and then turn it over to you and maybe you can mm -hmm. elaborate um, but you, you note that the great financial crisis has triggered much soul searching within the economics profession and the policymaking community. And that's true. I know I've rethought some of my views and I've learned a lot since then. Um, but you go on to say, but has this soul searching gone far enough? And you put, I shall argue that it has not. Um, mm -hmm. And so you go on and, and say there's three areas in kind of mainstream macroeconomics, mainstream monetary policy analysis that need to be updated or um, um, change the thinking? And, and I was hoping you could touch on those and, and tell us where do we need to go as a profession? Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's a long, that would be a long story. So. Well, let's, let's do this. Uh, let's do one, let's do one at a time. Let's start with the, the let's do one piece at a time. Uh, um, let's start with the equilibrium natural interest rate. Right, um, right. Tell us about that. Okay, well, the, the, the notion of equilibrium or natural rate that um, is, uh, I would say, mainstream uh, these days goes back to uh, Vixel, and it's basically always a, is a modern, modern incarnation of, uh, of Vixel's story. And it basically says that it's a, it's a rate that um, uh, basically equates output. It's a real rate that equates output at potential and makes uh, inflation stable, the two things being equivalent. Um, now, uh, what's interesting is that this notion of, uh, of the natural rate has also given a rise to the view, which I'm sure you have come across, that the natural rate is very, very low, possibly even negative, and that rate, that equilibrium natural rate is at the same time the cause of major financial instability. And this is a view that, for example, uh, Summers has put forward in, um, yeah. in his secular stagnation hypothesis. Now, I think that it, it, this is almost a contradiction in terms because it's hard to think how you can have an equilibrium or natural rate which generates the very problems that you are supposed to try and avoid, which is huge macroeconomic costs and huge uh, instability. And I, to my mind, this goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's more a symptom of the incompleteness of the models that we use to, to understand the, how the macroeconomy works. Uh, that is, models that don't really have financial the potential for financial instability as one of their ingredients, and therefore that play down the potential destabilizing uh, role that the financial system uh, and monetary policy can play. So this, in a nutshell, is is the the story about the natural rate. I think that we have to have a concept of the natural rate that is not just uh, ensuring that output is at potential, that inflation is stable, and so on and so forth, but that also that it is consistent with sustainable economic expansions, and therefore with uh, some notion of financial equilibrium. Um, and indeed, in, in a recent paper that we produced in July, we, we tried to go at least one step uh, further in, in that direction by, by calculating what something like that might be, by deviating as little as possible from, from traditional models, but mm -hmm. allowing for uh, this possibility of uh, financial booms and busts in, into the system.
And we show that uh, if one does it that way, even by making uh, relatively simple changes to the basic assumptions and encompassing the, the traditional model, you get uh, natural rates that are lower, uh, sorry, higher than the current estimate. You get uh, natural rates that have declined by less. And in particular, if monetary policy was to try to deal with the financial booms and busts in a more systematic way, uh, then you would be able to have uh, higher natural rates as well. Okay. So if I can summarize your view, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but what, what I took away from that article, that part of the natural interest rate discussion, is that the, the, the traditional view, the Vexelian traditional view, is that um, we know we don't obs- first we don't observe this natural interest rate. That's one no. of the key things. It's it's a latent variable, but it's important given the standard kind of New Keynesian view of the world. We need we need the you know monetary policy is done in such a way that it needs to align its target interest rate with this market clearing um, natural interest rate value. And one way we know we're not doing that is if inflation starts to take off. If inflation takes off, it must be the case, according to the standard view, that we've pushed interest rates below the natural rate. We've pushed interest rates below the market clearing, the stabilizing value. Um, And what you argue is that's not sufficient, right? You argue that you could still, you could have low inflation and still have the interest rate below the natural rate and one sign of that would be a buildup of financial imbalances. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it, which is basically just uh, repeating what uh, we had said about the the problems that were building up before the financial crisis. Inflation was low and stable, uh, but low interest rates were contributing to the buildup of financial imbalances that were then creating major problems down the road for, for the real economy. So the, the notion of the natural rate should also incorporate some sense of equilibrium stability in the financial system because that financial system and the real economy are inextricably uh, linked and problems in one create big problems for, for, for the other. I agree with you. I, I take a slightly different route in, in reaching that mm-hmm. conclusion, though, and that is you know, the natural rate has embedded in it productivity growth. Right? If you do a basic growth model, one yeah. of the terms is, some would say the trend growth, I, I, but deeper down is the productivity growth rate. So you know, you, you re, we talked about the pre-2008 period, the, the credit boom. right? So we had low inflation, um, but productivity, as I mentioned before, it, it took off during that period. It, was, it really grew rapidly. Yeah, and yeah. You know, all else equal, as a standard macro model would, would would tell you the natural rate had gone up, mm-hmm. um, and and so in my view, it, it seems the Fed by failing to recognize that, it, yeah, it, rates were below the natural rate during the, the pre two thousand eight period, and because they were below, they fueled the financial imbalances. So that, right. that makes complete sense. So here's where I, I struggle. Maybe you can help me understand. Yeah. So yeah. since since 2008, you know, we've been in the slump. Um, Larry Summers has his explanation for it. Um, one thing we haven't had since 2008 is rapid productivity growth. This, in fact, this yep. is, you know, there's a debate on whether we're measuring it properly, but we'll put that to the side. Um, but we haven't had rapid productivity growth. So I'm having a hard time understanding. You know, what is there? Are, are we creating financial imbalances now? I mean. Your measure would suggest we are, you know, based on the fact that rates are still low, uh, below the natural rate. Others' measures would say they're not. But one thing that, that does seem clear to me is is that productivity is is not booming and therefore not right. creating the destabilizing row maybe that it did prior to the crisis. Well, I, I think that the, the key question uh, that you're raising, and it is at the end of the day, is it is an empirical question, is whether it is the behavior of productivity or the okay. behavior of uh, what we call financial imbalances, the behavior of credit, property prices, and whatever that gives you a better sense of uh, where the problems uh, might or whether the problems might might arise. Um, uh, having said that, I mean, what is what is happening is if you take if you take this argument um, uh, over different business and financial cycles. What happens is that you get a situation in which um, 
you, uh, you f- f- asymmetric uh, monetary policies over successive cycles tend to lead to what we call a debt trap and might actually, over mm-hmm. time, tend to reduce any any reasonable me- measure of the of the natural rate as well, because what they what they basically do is that so they fail to lean against the boom, um, mm-hmm. the booms and busts, uh, then that creates the bust. The bust causes long-term economic damage, including, by the way, persistent uh, low productivity growth. And this is something that we have shown in another paper that we have, uh, I don't know whether you have seen that we released, I think, at the beginning of the, beginning of the year. We could talk about that. But it's actually mentioned, I think, in the Cato, in the Cato speech. Um, okay. Then policy responds very aggressively and persistently to the bust. So in the seeds of the next problem, but over time, what this does, it imparts a downward bias to interest rates and an upward bias to debt, which we actually are seeing. So that at some point it's very hard for you to raise interest rates without creating the very problems you're trying to avoid because there's too much debt out there and, and the economy simply cannot take it. So over time, you're running out of policy ammunition because uh, inter- your interest rates are falling and falling, and it becomes harder to raise them without creating problems. So this is what we call a, a kind of debt trap. So that over sufficiently long horizons, low interest rates in the past are a reason why you see such low rates or even lower rates today. So that's the sense in which we talk about okay. the low rates or too low rates be getting lower rates. And uh, so that what we take, what policymakers take as given, as exogenous, as economists would say, uh, mm-hmm. at a particular point in time, is in fact, in part, in part, the result of their past policy decisions. Uh, so, uh, and this is something which is very important <clears throat> to, to bear in mind. And the main mechanism is through the accumulation or destabilizing accumulation of stocks. So how do we get out of the debt trap? If it's been this burden we've created, how do we uh, put ourselves on the right path? Well, I think it's uh, it's it's clearly it's not easy. It's obviously not mm-hmm. easy. I mean, they they are typical. You know what the typical ways are. Uh, one is through growth, if you can mm-hmm. get it, uh, mainly through structural measures and the like. The mm-hmm. other is through um, uh, restructuring ordering the restructuring of the debt where it is excessive. And a lot has and should be done, in, in for example, in the case of the banking sector. Uh, and the other possibility economists would tell you is, well, basically just higher inflation. But it's not just higher inflation. It's higher inflation in the context of um, a financial repression. And it's not obvious to me that that type of inflation would also be an inflation that would help generate growth. So that is okay. a, a very tricky uh, line to follow. Well, let me continue on. Um, you know, the context we were discussing was your Cato Journal article. Um, you're, you're revisiting the three pillars of monetary policy. We, we covered the first one, um, reconsidering you know, how we think about the natural interest rate. And I'm, I'm going to skip the second one because we've really discussed it already, and that is yeah. you know, money neutrality. We, we, you know, this whole debt cycle low rates beget other low rates. So I want to move to the last one, and this is one that's been near and dear to my heart. I've actually worked on that, and as I mentioned, George Selgin was my professor, so um, I've, I've, I've thought about this too. And this is the um, idea of deflation always being a bad thing everywhere and right. always. And, and you make the case, well, no, not so, not so fast. It, it's conditional upon the state of the economy and what's driving it. So can you mm-hmm. talk about that? Um, yes, well, I, I think that the, the general view these days is that uh, there is a very tight, almost logical link between deflation and, and recession. It's a kind of Pavlovian reaction. Uh, whenever you, you mention the term deflation, people will think, oh, it must be terrible, there must be a, ter- a, a bad recession, depression, or whatever. And alongside that, you have concerns with downward spirals. Uh, so the idea here is that prices fall, uh, fall, monetary policy hits the zero lower bound, it cannot do much, that leads to further falls in prices and the contractions in demand, either because households tend to postpone consumption, uh, the Euler equation, or because the real value of debt increases the pressing uh, demand further. Now, uh, people tend to forget that whether 
uh, falls in, let's be more technical, falls or persistent falls in the price level are um, bad or are associated with contractions or not is ultimately an empirical question. Um, just to simplify, if prices fall because of decreases in demand, then one is likely to see lower prices and lower output and therefore def deflations being quote unquote contractionary. If they fall because there are increases in supply on the, on the other hand, think of the aggregate supply curve in the simple models, then one would tend to see lower prices but higher output and therefore expansionary. And this is really the origin of um, uh, the distinction between good and bad deflations that goes back to quite a number of years ago. Uh, now, the, the historical evidence uh, that uh, we have seen, and some of which uh, we have produced, is not really consistent with the view that deflation is always costly. So empirical evidence had already put forward the distinction between good and bad deflations. We've taken some steps further by also looking at the relationship with asset prices and, and, and debt. And we basically f find three findings. The first is we confirm previous work. And we show that or we find that there is a weak link between deflations and output growth. The second finding is that um, the link arises largely from the Great Depression, the experience of the 30s. And even that link disappears once the behavior of asset prices is taken into account. And we find no evidence of, cost, of the costly interaction between debt deflation uh, sorry, debt and deflation, the Fisherian uh, debt deflation. But we find evidence of such an interaction between debt and property prices, especially house prices. And of course, the, okay. what happened most recently is, is an example of that. Um, so the results are consistent with the notion that many deflations are supply-driven, or at least benign, and that concerns with spirals are overdone. Um, and there are many factors that may help to drive prices down, including technological change, globalization. Think of the entry of former communist countries into the global trading system in um, since the 1990s and, uh, and yeah. more recently. Um, so, and even the example of Japan, which is often quoted as as how things can go wrong when you have deflation, uh, upon closer examination, does not really uh, support that view. Yeah, I mean, I, I this view here, I think, helps us understand what happened in the early mid two thousands. Again, going back to that productivity boom, I, I keep talking about. Um, you know, that was driven. There was technological uh, reasons for that productivity boom, but also the opening up of Asia. I think was a big part of that. Massive sub labor supply shocks, technological supply shocks, and uh, had the Fed been less fearful of the you know disinflationary, or even deflationary pressures during that time. They may have been sooner to raise interest rates than they did, and may have, you know, forestalled some of the, uh, the excessive boom in credit creation during that time. Um, but it's this fear, right? It's this kind of knee-jerk response, this kind of inbred fear: deflation must always be avoided, as opposed to um, what is the source of it. And you know, I've looked at the post-bellum period in the U.S. So after the Civil War up until the late 1800s, I know you have as well, and a number of authors have. But it's striking because during that period. And there were a few bad episodes, but on average, you know, real GDP grew almost 4%, you mm -hmm. know, from about mid-1860s to mid-1890s, almost 4% real GDP growth, complemented by almost 2% deflation. So that's like 30 years where on average prices fell 2% a year, and the real GDP grew about 4% a year. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely foreign world to anyone today, right? If you told someone, hey, you know, over the next 30 years, prices will fall on average 2% a year, it, you know, mine would blow. It's just, it, it but seems it, so different. It, yeah. um, but, I mean, you don't really, uh, this is, of course, one of the episodes which is included in the, in the analysis, in the cross-country analysis that yep. we did, uh, looking at many countries over many, many, many years. But even if you look at uh, more recent examples, um, China has seen over the last uh, uh, decade uh, significant, uh, at least episodes of periods of uh, deflation in the traditional sense, and yet, of course, has been growing very, very fast. But even uh, even if you go beyond China, if you look at the recent experience of Sweden, you will see that that country has had uh, quite strong growth, uh, but 
consistent, but at the same time falling prices. And even the country where I live in, which is Switzerland, is a country in which um, uh, we have had uh, falling prices for quite some time, but not stellar, but quite solid uh, GDP growth and very low unemployment. Uh, um, so, but of course, a number of these countries, not all of them, but a number of these countries, well, at least the three that I mentioned have definitely seen at the same mm-hmm. time, which is quite worrying strong increases in credit and strong increases in property prices that uh, have been a source of concern for the for the policymakers so this is the the irony in all this is that uh, as we had discussed in a number of papers a number of years ago actually uh, lean too strongly against the good deflation may set up may paradoxically lead to bad deflations uh, further down the road, if you have a big bust in, in the economy, a contraction in demand, and if as a result of that contraction uh, of aggregate demand, then uh, there is downward pressure on uh, goods prices. <clears throat> so embrace the good deflation today or face the bad deflation tomorrow. Uh, is a there is a trade-off. There is a trade-off. Yeah. And I think the trick, uh, the important uh, policy uh, implication of, of all this is to look very closely at the sources of uh, falling prices before uh, calibrating a policy response. And the other and the other sort of implication, of course, is to perhaps pay less attention to fine-tuning inflation numbers and more attention to uh, what happens on the financial side, the financial cycles, the financial booms and busts. Okay, let me switch to um, the time we have left. We're getting near the end of the show here, but let me let me switch to a paper you just put out. You co-authored, um, I believe it came out in July of this year, where you and your co-author go back and you. It, it's a great paper because you kind of go back and summarize the literature on unconventional monetary policies. You call it a reappraisal. So you go back and you look at all the QEs that's been done all the different forward guidance, the use of the balance sheets. Um, and Tell us about that paper and what did you find by going back and studying the literature on unconventional monetary <coughs> policy? Mm, well, um, the, um, what we basically find by looking at the, the, at the evidence is that there is clearly plenty of evidence that uh, the various unconventional monetary policies uh, have uh, had a major impact on yields and on, on asset prices. I think there is no question about that. The evidence is is clear. Uh, I think it's, and all you have to do is to uh, watch out of the window or, or, or more precisely just look at the TV and hear what, how financial market participants are responding to, to these policies. It is much harder. You, sure. Let me ask you, one, when you, you say major... So let me just, this, I want to ask like actual magnitude. So say, let's do, for example, the U.S. U.S. since, uh, let's go back to 2007, 10-year Treasury yield was about five, almost five and a quarter percent. And now it's one, one and a half. So are you saying most of that decline is due to QE or just, or just a, a meaningful amount? No, I would say a meaningful amount of that. I would not say okay, because uh, some of that's due, and I think and, and I think that uh, I don't have the the, the numbers. Um, uh, you know, that I couldn't say off the top of my head, but in the paper we have some yes. we review the various estimates and provide uh, provide some figures. But a, a, a significant, uh, a sizable amount of that would okay. would be attributed to the policies followed by by the central banks. It's not just QE for guidance and so on and so forth. I mean, there are many okay. aspects, many aspects okay. to this. Um, what, of course, is much harder is to find clear evidence of, uh, of an impact on output and, and inflation because, unfortunately, and this is, there's nothing you can really do about this, m- much of that has to rely on extrapolations from previous relationships, some of which are highly dubious, like going from the size and structure of the central bank balance sheet to economic activity. And in fact, one should not expect to have seen much of a relationship at all on conceptual grounds or trying to go from the same size and structure of the central bank balance sheet to some kind of synthetic or shadow rates or shadow yields and so on. So it's very, it's very difficult to, to, um, to get a good um, – 
solid uh, empirical evidence uh, of the relationship between those policies and inflation and, and output on, on, the other, uh, on the other hand. Um, but of course there are, uh, and this is really in, in that part of the, of the work, we really go beyond what uh, the empirical evidence uh, can suggest. But I think there are reasons to believe that those relationships, past relationships also need not hold. One has mm -hmm. to do with the economic context. Um, and it's the idea that over-indebted agents tend to retrench and repair the balance sheets when they realize that you've taken, and they've taken on more debt than they can repay. And of course, in broken financial systems fails to transmit policy adequately. This is what typically happens during a financial bust. Now, some countries have dealt with those problems better than, better than others. But there are also uh, um, reasons to believe that there might be diminishing returns because of the intrinsic nature of these policies, because there are, of course, limits to how far risk premia can be compressed or expectations guided or interest rates, rates pushed into negative territory. And as those limits are hit, are reached, um, then the policy effectiveness tends to, to worsen. Now, another of this example of all this has to do with the impact of these rates through the financial system, which again is not something that is easily embedded into models, but low rates tend to, um, and as a very flat term structure, tend to undermine bank profitability, which can in turn then reduce incentives and ability to, to lend. They put insurance companies and pension funds under strain because they have longer maturity, the liability, sorry, the maturity of their liabilities is longer than that of their assets. Um, they may inhibit the ability of shift resources from low productivity firms to higher productivity firms. Um, you know, the, the story of the zombie banks and then the zombie companies. And then there are also broader questions about confidence. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's some perverse effects here because sometimes in order to convince markets that you will keep interest rates for, for low for very long, for example, you have to paint a rather bleak picture of the macroeconomic outlook. And although that might get markets to keep, uh, you know, to price in those rates, it may also have counter, um, you know, it may be, create problems for for the confidence of the people that you really want to to reach, I mean the the businessmen and and households, um, and there is a broader question of uh, even people understanding what's going on. I think when you st for example when you start uh, uh, shifting into negative interest rates, it's very very hard to communicate to the average person why those rates are as low as they are, and that can really sort of backfire in terms of in terms of confidence. Um, and then, of course, there are a number of political economy considerations that uh, have to be taken into account, which are quite important uh, in terms of what all this could do to the credibility and, and independence of central banks going forward. So it, they, these policies used to be seen as a free lunch. Now it's clear that they're no longer perceived uh, so easily, or no, so clearly as a free lunch. Central banks are very, very aware of uh, the possible collateral damage that the, these policies might create. But then, of course, there is a question of uh, balance of benefits and costs, and it's here where different assessments can be made. Yeah, well, I know in the case of the U.S., the, uh, the hopes and claims of Fed officials were for a much greater outcome than actually happened. Um, you know, the QE was supposed to you know, boost the recovery, shore up aggregate demand growth. And, and they might argue, and some do argue, that it maybe it did put a floor under the economy, but it definitely yeah. didn't live up to the expectations and the hopes. Um, I, and, clearly, also one has to make a, a very, very sharp distinction between what I would call the crisis management phase and the, uh -huh. uh, and the crisis resolution phase. The crisis management phase, uh, you have to pull out all, all the stops and so on, and 
clearly quantitative, uh, these types of measures can be seen as more in line with the traditional lender of last resort policies, but in a much broader sense. In crisis resolution, the, the, the key is to try and repair balance sheets and the like. And this is something that uh, monetary policy can uh, is not particularly effective. If anything, it could, uh, it could actually delay, in some cases, uh, adjustment. For example, when it comes to, to the banks, as we have seen in some jurisdictions, yeah. because it's much easier to keep uh, providing credit to the companies that are uh, not in very good shape, partly because you don't want to recognize losses. And then that would mean that if you have some kind of capital constraints, you would be uh, reducing the credit supply or and raising the price for for the better for the better customers. I mean, the bottom line is that if yeah, d during financial busts, deleveraging is a necessary, and we have quite a lot of empirical evidence to that effect, deleveraging is a necessary condition for a self-sustained and a strong recovery. And um, some of these policies, uh, rather than helping, may uh, actually hinder it. Okay. You know, I, <clears throat> I, I, I too think that, you know, QE has not been, um, the results of QE have not been very firm in terms of real recovery, inflation growth, part of the objective of doing them. I, al I also have some skepticism about how effective it has been, even in changing yields. I know you, you take a different view. Yeah, um, yeah. Th there's, you know, but there's some folks who argue, you know, a lot of the evidence for even the effect on the yields is based on event studies and, you know, how, how much does it really get the permanent change in yields? And, and really, I guess this goes back to the question of where is the natural rate? Are rates low because central banks have been intervening or are rates yeah. low because we've been in a slump? And even, even in the latter case, even if rates are low because we've been in a slump or a weak recovery, I think you could argue and go back and say, well, okay, sure, but that goes back to the debt cycle, right? It goes back to yeah. previous, previous mistakes that were made. But it's a fascinating conversation, one that you know, we will continue to discuss as time goes on. Now, we have just a few minutes left, and I, I want to turn over to you in closing. Um, with all this experience behind you and your work in the field, what would you recommend to a budding young macro economist, someone who's going into the field? A budding young what would you, economist. Yeah. yeah, what would you tell them, you know, how to, how to make the most of this career? What would you recommend to them? Well, I think that it depends very much what what they want to do. I mean, and this is, uh, there, there is a serious problem, uh, problem with incentives. Um, I think if they want to uh, try and find their own way in, in economics, um, I would suggest to them, uh, not to stop at whatever they learn in, in university and to try and uh, look at uh, a bit more, you know, how the history, the evolution of economic thinking has been over the years, so the history of economic thought. And, and as, as I think came out quite clearly from our conversation, also economic history, I think that there is a lot that can be learned from that. It provides a lot of perspective that would otherwise be very difficult mm -hmm. to, to obtain. And by the way, let me say that uh, even when I was at university, I mean, I, I didn't actually do this. Uh, they sort of uh, delving more into, into, into history was something that uh, I did uh, after, after I left, and I don't regret having done it. Um, so uh, that, for me, it's, it's important. The second thing that I find uh, that I think is very important is to don't be afraid of um, uh, uh, questioning sometimes conventional wisdom uh, um, and, um, and be curious um, and try and read, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, a broad range of uh, broad range of views as opposed to just uh, focusing on, on on the models. The key problem very often is that sometimes the questions that we ask are are uh, constrained by the tools that we can use, and I think that's uh, that's very bad. Uh, I think uh, modeling is extremely important to clarify one's thinking. Um, but we should not 
be too constrained by uh, the fashion of the uh, the fashion of the day when when asking particular questions, and I think that's that's part of the problem that um, exists in, in in the in the profession, where of course you have to to publish at all costs, and in order to publish at all costs, the the incentives are structured in such a way uh, as to do minor adjustments to existing uh to the existing body of work as opposed to try and think a little bit more freely well those are great recommendations to end the show on our guest today has been claudio barrio claudio thank you so much for being on the show well, thank you so much for having me macro musings is produced by the mercatus center at george mason university If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.